morning. Nice to, nice to be here. Appreciate your having me, Scott, and everybody at A-plus Challenge. We thank you very much for putting on this great event. I look forward to sharing the stage with my much more distinguished colleagues uh, here in a few minutes. Um, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be back both in Houston and specifically at the Museum of Fine Arts. I was thinking about what famous work of art might best represent the state of public education these days, Scott. And I think far and away it's the scream. Uh, I think following the, uh, following the cuts to public education last session of uh, uh, pretty much the entire state, whether you're a teacher, student, a property owner dependent on property values, lawmaker, your reaction was basically this. Um, and I think that as you roll forward into the 83rd session, it's a cheap joke, but it's a good joke. Um, as you roll into the 83rd session, I suspect the reaction of people to this issue is, is, uh, is all the more that. Uh, and I'll say a few words about that in a second. I want to say a word about the Tribune, not as an ad for what we do, but more as a way to feed into the role that the media, I think, in the most positive and optimistic sense, uh, has been playing and can play. Uh, we, were star we started, the Tribune started, uh, in the fall of 2009. We launched in November of 2009. And we launched as a reaction to an unfortunate but I think undeniable decline in coverage of serious issues in the media around Texas, not just the newspapers, but the broadcast media as well. Uh, we have wonderful newspapers in Texas doing the very best job they can these days with limited resources, resources that are much more uh, limited than they have been over the last five years, ten years, and, and ago. When I moved to Texas in 1991 to work at Texas Monthly, I went on to run Texas Monthly as editor and then as president, spent almost 18 years there, but got to Texas Monthly in 1991. There were still two daily papers in Houston, in Dallas, in San Antonio. Even as recently as 1991, there were still two daily papers in El Paso. The number of reporters in the Capitol Press Corps was three times the number we have today. And the coverage that those papers provided of issues, big issues that affect every single Texan, public and higher education, obviously of interest to this group, uh, energy and the environment, healthcare, criminal justice, transportation, uh, and immigration, clearly a much bigger and more consequential issue today as we are in a discussion nationwide of comprehensive immigration reform than even in, in 1991. But the, the portfolio of issues that we care about and that we ought to care about was covered more regularly and more aggressively, I would submit to you back then, simply because the numbers were great, the number of papers and number of reporters. We didn't have the technology available. We didn't have as many people who, as individuals, could have the same role in a conversation about those issues as the big brands do. But certainly, the numbers were greater back then. A number of us in the Capitol Press Corps and 07, 08, we're looking at this situation, the disappearance of newspapers and the disappearance of reporters and the decline in coverage and thought we need to see if there's a way to preserve public service journalism because it benefits <laughs> all Texans. To have the issues explained clearly in a way to every single person in the state to have them be made aware of why they have a stake in the outcome of these fights, to be given a reason to care, to be motivated to take action, without regard to what that action is. We have a lot of partisan media in this country. We don't need more of that. The media should not be telling you what to think. They should simply be telling you to think and giving you the means to be more thoughtful and productive and engaged citizens. And that was really what the Tribune was going to ultimately be about, was a means to put this great public service, nonpartisan reporting about those big issues, just public <coughs> policy, politics and government out in the world and then give average Texans the opportunity to engage, to give them a motivation to make better choices, the means to make better choices, not just at election time, but at all times. We have a really low level of engagement in this state among individuals on these big issues. Many people in the state don't know who represents them at the Capitol in Washington or the Capitol in Austin. And more importantly, they don't know what those people do. Uh, not just during the 140 days every two years when they happen to be in session, but all year, every day. These folks make policies, they pass laws, they spend tax dollars, and the awareness of those activities is really low, and it's too low. And for a great state, a state that we all love, like Texas, we all ought to be playing more of a role in this participatory democracy. So as corny as that sounds, the Tribune was founded to raise the level of civic engagement. Uh, and so three and a quarter years in, we have uh, 37 full-time employees, 17 <laughs> reporters, which makes us just about half of the regular working press corps at the Capitol, which I'm afraid says more about us than them. Uh, we cover these issues ambitiously, aggressively, and again, in nonpartisan fashion. We have, I think, some of the very best reporters in the state. 
maybe some of the best reporters in the country covering this stuff, and it's all free. If you go to texastribune.org, you will see our content every day. If you read the New York Times on Fridays and Sundays, you know that we provide co coverage on Friday and Sunday, two pages each day in the New York Times. We also make our content available for free to newspapers and other media organizations around the state. And we do this through the generosity of individuals, foundations, and corporations. We're a 501c3. The innovation here is that we're a nonprofit. We put ourselves out in the world as a public good and make the case to individuals who might be inclined to support us that the work we're doing has value to the community you live in and to the community of Texas, and so you support us, and that makes it possible for us to put this content out in the world. We've raised $17.8 million in a little more than three years with a model that is totally untested up until this point to make this happen. And it's optimistic to hear that uh, uh, people are willing to contribute to make this happen. We, we can do this, we can pay for this, and we can continue to put this great work out in the world. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is educate people about the realities of life in Texas, good, bad, and in between. It's not a booster organization, we're not a chamber of commerce, we don't just tell you the good stuff, but nor are we looking to tear Texas down. We're simply looking to give people a perspective on what's really going on and then let them formulate their own opinions and make their own choices. Now this ties into public education in a very important way. When the public is aware of what's going on, on school finance, on the debate over choice and vouchers, on the debate over student testing and accountability, on the debate over career and technical education, to name four enormous topics related to public education that are now very actively being discussed at the Capitol. When the public is more aware of those issues, the public makes its point of view known, and legislators hear them. Now, whether they actually take action on that basis is another question. But make no mistake that when people in the state of Texas, regular individual, average, everyday folks, make their points of view known on public education funding, on whether or not we ought to give uh, families whose kids are in low-performing schools the opportunity to change schools, on whether we think the STAR test or the TOX test before it is the right way to measure the performance of schools and whether too much time is being devoted to preparing for those tests every year, and whether we're giving non-Anglo kids an adequate chance of graduation from high school and a future. Uh, your voice matters, but you can only really have a voice if you're educated on those issues. And the importance of the media in educating you cannot be overstated, I think. For me, the biggest disappointment in watching the uh, effects of the economy over these last five or ten years on the media, the biggest disappointment has been that the media really do have a very important role to play in educating the public. What is the newspaper after all, but first of all, one of the only uh, shared experiences left in our communities. Think about the community you live in. We all walk around every day with headphones in our ears, or many of us do, and we block out the noise from outside. We curate our own Twitter feeds to keep out people we disagree with. We pick our cable channels based on the point of view that we already have, so it's basically preaching to the choir. You can go through a day or a week or a month and never talk to anybody you disagree with. Isn't that awful? Isn't that awful? The hard work of democracy is done when people of unlike mind get in a room and figure out the things that they can and do agree on. That's where the work of our democracy is really, really done. That's a, that is a properly functioning society by my definition. And unfortunately, we're all uh, cordoning ourselves off into these pods. And if you look at what's happening politically in the federal government, if you look at what's happening even in Austin, there are very few uh, issues on which Democrats and Republicans can find common ground these days. I think the system is broken, and I think, frankly, one of the reasons it's broken is that the public is not demanding loudly enough or forcefully enough that it be fixed. And one of the reasons that they're not demanding it is because they're not fully appreciating the complexities of the problem, and they don't really have the information that they need to make that case. Politicians fear for their jobs. Right? That's what they feel. I mean, there are politicians who will say to you, and I don't want to demean the ones who really believe this, I'm really here to represent my constituents, and I don't care whether I get reelected. I'm here to do the work of my constituents. And that may be the case in certain instances. But I'll tell you what, a whole lot of politicians are motivated by self-interest. When they're worried that you're going to take their job away from them, they tend to act so that you don't. And so having adequate information that gives you the means to go lobby, press your case, 
and essentially, whether implied or explicitly, threaten them that if you don't do what the community back home wants, we're going to make sure that somebody else gets in that job. That is a motivating factor for a lot of these guys. It is. So I think the role that the media plays in teeing up these issues for all of you, for all of them, to be better informed and to be a better participant in that democracy, it, it's, really, it's really quite something. But think about what happened on school finance in the last session. Go back to before the 2011 session, when we were only 41st in the country in per student spending. We're now 49th among the 50 states in D.C. after the cuts of 2011. But go back before that. We ambled along for many years, understanding that our system of funding public education was basically broken. Every couple of years, we would have a new one proposed because the old one would be found wanting. And we put it in place, OK, we think we have this fixed this time, only to find a couple of years later, no, we don't have it fixed. We have to go back to the well again. We are never and should never be satisfied with mediocre public education in the state. We go into the last legislative session, we have a shortfall of between 15 and 27 billion dollars, depending upon how you view it. And the unrestricted portion of the budget basically has three things in it. There are some other things that are smaller, but really it's public and higher education and health care. The vast majority of the dollars in the unrestricted portion of our budget. So if you have a shortfall of 15, to $27 billion, you're going to go, as Willie Sutton used to say about robbing banks, you're going to go where the money is. And where the money is in the budget is public and higher ed and health care. In some ways, you could say it's not personal. The legislature didn't come in gunning to cut public education, gunning to cut higher ed, gunning to cut health care. They really had no choice but to cut those things because that was all they could cut. So they started out proposing a cut of $10 billion. Then they got down to nine, then to seven, then to six, and eventually they settled on four. Some people calculate it to be more like 5.4 billion. But let's take the best possible face here, four billion dollars in cuts in public education. Amazing that the good news out of last session was we only cut four billion dollars, right? So we cut four billion dollars. That number, Erica and, and Morgan, who covered this so well in the last session, know that number was really presented for much of the last legislative session in the abstract. Four billion dollars. Well, what does it mean that you're cutting four billion? Well, we're going to cut four billion dollars. But for the average person back home in the one of the more than a thousand school districts, or in the more than 8,500 elementary, middle, and high schools, public schools in Texas, that number was really meaningless because they didn't understand exactly how that number affected them. At some point late in the session, it may have been Morgan, in fact, who proposed this, but we reached out to the people running the committees in the House and Senate and said, you all have spreadsheets, they call them the runs, that break down by school district what that $4 billion means. How much will Houston ISD lose in 2012 and in 2013 on a percentage basis and on a real dollar basis? How much will Cy Fair lose? How much will Spring Branch lose? How much will all these districts lose? Because if you personalize the cut, people then really understand better what the impact is. So we got those runs. And we built a database where you could type in your school district name and up would come the cuts. I would submit to you that the media's role is to do stuff like that. And by doing that, we're not taking the side of the people who don't want public education cut. Very often when the media provides information that runs counter to a narrative, the people who embrace that narrative say the media is biased. No, the media is doing its job. The media is providing information and letting people, regular people, decide what they think. But they can't decide what they think if we don't give them the information. So I believe that the, that the, the hullabaloo around those cuts really got to a heightened place after people got to appreciate what the specific impact on their school or their district was by virtue of that information, which existed there in the world but had not been published, was published. I think that was an important thing. And as you go into this session, the statistics I just cited, 41st in per student spending before the 2011 session, 49th now, that's information that a lot of people in the state don't know. And the media reporting that is not partisan or biased. It's simply providing you with facts. We now spend about $8,400 per enrolled public school student in the state, which puts us $3,100 below the national average. Only Arizona and Nevada spend less per student. And by saying that, that's not the media asserting that all that matters is money. Very often when you talk about cutting public education funding or per student spending, the assumption is that you are saying, as somebody in the media, only money matters. Nobody believes only money matters. But by the TEA's own ranking, 
rating system of students. The schools that are rated exemplary spend on average $1,000 per student more than the schools that are rated unacceptable. And as you go down the list from exemplary to recognized, recognized to acceptable, acceptable to unacceptable, the amount of money per student is less and less and less, and the least is unacceptable. I went into journalism so I wouldn't have to do math. I can do that math. <laughs> I can do that math. And what it says to me is, again, information needs to get out to the public so the public can decide whether this stuff matters. Senate passed a budget yesterday that your own new Senator Sylvia Garcia as well as Senator Wendy Davis from Fort Worth opposed. I didn't see Senator Garcia's comments. I did see Senator Davis's comments. She opposed the budget for one reason. You didn't fund public education adequately. The other 29 senators, including a number of Democrats, including John Whitmire, including Rodney Ellis, including people who represent this area, said, we understand what the budget circumstances are. We're going to support this budget. And then the people will decide whether they're happy with that outcome or not. That's how it goes. We're not going to get back to the pre-2011 session level of funding education. We're just not. And this, this pesky school finance lawsuit, which is as yet unresolved, is being appealed by the state, is pushing farther out the question of what we're going to do on school finance. In some ways, the legislature is taking a pass on really confronting it, using the school finance lawsuit being unresolved as an excuse. And I kind of understand that. They don't want to make a decision and then all of a sudden have to come back in 2014 and undo it and redo it. But goodness gracious, this question has been in flux. This question of what we should be doing about equalization and adequacy and the formulas. It's been in flux for how long? Forever? For a long time. Now, those of you who love public education may appreciate the fact that we're talking about funding and oh God and the press needs to do a better job of explaining this and the people need to know. But let me flip that around. We were told when the public education cuts happened that hellfire and brimstone would rain down on Texas as a result of those cuts. And you know what? It's not conclusive that that's what's happened. And there are a lot of people in this room who are big public education advocates, I'm sure, who don't want to hear that. But again, the media's job is not to give you what you want, it's to tell you the truth. And in some districts, the reality is that those cuts have had the impact that was predicted, but in others, it's not the case. It is not as clear cut as people predicted it would be. And that's one of the reasons that this is such a complicated question to unstick. I think if every single district had been gutted by those cuts, it would be a different conversation, but that's not been the case. There are districts that gave raises since those cuts. There are districts that have added staff since those cuts. Yes, there's the district in South Texas that Morgan and others wrote about that had to cut sports. Imagine that in the state of Texas, they cut sports as a result of these cuts. And I've met at least one person here today who told me that she was laid off from her district. And I'm sure there are others. But the fact is, that's not the story in every district. And in some ways, isn't that the point of the school lawsuit after all, right? That every district is different? And that to apply a one-size-fits-all is probably not the best course. So I think the media has absolutely important role to play in litigating on that specific issue of, of where the public comes down and how the public gets its information. I think the media has an important role to play. On the two issues that have been so dominant during this session other than school finance, on choice and vouchers on the one hand and testing on the other, interesting to me. So we started the conversation about choice and vouchers at the beginning of the session with Senator Dan Patrick, now chairman of the Public Education Committee, and Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst in a parochial school in Austin talking about their intentions for the session. Telegraphing, some would say, their intentions. If you have a child in a low-performing school, we want to give that child an opportunity to move to a better school, whether that's a public school or implied or explicit, a non-public school. And that conversation has taken all kinds of twists and turns. And where we end up now is at a very um, different place. We are no longer openly talking about taking tax dollars and allowing them to be provided to parents in the form of a voucher and letting those tax dollars migrate out of the public education system and into parochial or private schools where the same accountability measures that would accompany those dollars in public schools perhaps don't transfer. And I think the press, Erica Morgan and their colleagues in covering public education had a role to play in letting the public know that one of the possibilities of legislation that had yet to be filed at that point was that public dollars might migrate out of the public system and out of view. 
and out of the accountability system as part of this plan. Where we are right now is, is not where we started. We're going to have, we think, choice legislation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say we think it's going to pass. I don't think we, get, we know. I think we'll know when it, we, we know. But choice legislation that will effectively be open enrollment within public school districts that would allow a kid in a failing school within a public school district to go to another public school. We'll have some expanded charters, although even that, Morgan tells me this morning, and we'll talk about up on the panel, there's been a little bit of a change even in what's planned in terms of expanding the number of, of charters. And there's a plan to have businesses make contributions in exchange for a tax deduction that would fund scholarships for kids who wanted to leave the public school system and, and go into parochial private schools. And that would be a tax credit for those businesses, but it wouldn't be like tax dollars that would be leaving the public. It's even hard to explain. It's complicated. <laughs> it would be different than an individual's tax dollars being sent out of the system. But of course, that's being criticized because if it's a tax deduction, isn't that effectively yes. Yes. public money? Yes. So, I mean, you know, this issue is, again, very complicated, hard to explain, even if you spend time thinking about the stuff all day, as we do. The public needs more information. The public has to be given an opportunity to have a part of this conversation. Similarly, on testing and accountability, this is, you know, I say there are no bipartisan issues in the Texas legislature. Oh, this is a bipartisan issue. 86% at last count, 86% of school boards representing 93% of enrolled Texas public school students, or 4.4 million students. 86% of school boards have passed resolutions against the current regime of testing. And so, you know, everybody in the legislature, if you ask them who's responsible for this regime being there in the first place, like cartoon characters, they all do this. <laughs> Nobody wants to own how this started. They all want to own how it's going to end, right? But, you know, this has been presented, Morgan and, and Erica and their best colleagues notwithstanding, this has been presented by a lot of people in the press as an all or nothing scenario. The only two likely outcomes, the only two outcomes that are not likely, let me say it this way, are all or nothing. <clears throat> we're not going to end the session where we began, and we're not going to end the session with zero tests and zero accountability. But in some ways, the extremes have defined the conversation when the reality of that conversation is somewhere in the middle. Chairman Acock on the House side, his HB5, I think, would do five tests. Florence Shapiro, who used to be Senate Public Education Chairwoman, is now outside the legislature, is talking that she and her allies in this issue would like to see something more like eight tests. So we're looking at something in the middle. What does that mean? What should those tests amount to from the standpoint of an end of course grade? And are we spending too much time teaching to the test? Or are we simply educating kids on things that matter that also happen to be on tests. <laughs> this is my point. There is not another topic that I could be talking about today where I'd have people talking back to me. <laughs> and I don't mind it, by the way. But I think this tells you, this tells you what the situation has become and why the media needs to help play a role refereeing, mediating, and educating on what is and is not the case within the realm of accountability and testing. So all really interesting. I mentioned career in tech. I'll just add that on as a fourth because I think that may be the next frontier. A lot of concerns about the dropout rate in Texas, a lot of concerns about black and brown kids being pushed out of schools, not giving an opportunity to graduate outside the curriculum requirements that are now baked into the cake. And there are some people who advocate for a career in tech track as an alternative means of graduating for the simple reason that we need welders and pipe fitters and we need kids in the career and tech fields and if they're forced out of high school by not being able to take the regular courses and graduate then we lose them uh, in a lot of different ways and it's a bad it's a bad outcome for everybody and there might ought to be an alternative scenario now there's disagreement about this beginning with the commissioner of education michael williams who believes that a career and tech track separate and apart from the four by four would represent dumping those kids but there are just as many people who say, look, we have to figure out a way to give every kid, and every kid is not the same, just as every school is not the same. We have to give every single kid an opportunity to find a path out and into the world of work. 
And that may involve going to a four-year elite college. It may involve going to a four-year non-elite college. It may involve going to a community college. It may involve going to a career in tech school. And it may involve simply moving out to Midland, which right now is the highest per capita city in the country. Or down to the Eagleford Shale and finding a job that ultimately may pay them more than any of us make. Right? So there are people who believe career in tech is the next topic of conversation that's going to join those first three. And again, it's a place where the media has a role to play explaining what's really going on. That, in the end, is, I think, where we come down and where we ought to come down. The far left and the far right have very little that they agree on these days, but they agree on this. They both think they're not being told the whole story. They may disagree on what they think that whole story is, but they both think they're not being told the whole story. The press can play a role if it sticks to the facts, if it understands its traditional function, if it doesn't pick sides. And there are going to be people who believe that the press picks sides no matter what the press does. When we started the Tribune, I got to consult with some political fundraisers on the left and the right about potential people who might support us. And the Republican fundraiser said to me, when you go out in the world and talk about the Tribune to Democrats, to liberals, talk about journalism. When you talk to conservatives, to Republicans, talk about Texas. Because when conservatives hear journalism, they hear liberal. And in some ways, the idea of nonpartisan media, whether it's the Tribune or anybody else, is a little bit like jumbo shrimp. It's, it's, it may be a tad too oxymoronic to persuade people of its truth. <laughs> but the fact is, we in the press can be absolutely down the middle, and I think are, in most cases, the good ones are. We don't have to tell you what to think, as I said at the beginning. We, we ought to tell you to think, and we ought to provide you with the means to do that. And I think organizations like ours, alongside the traditional media like the Houston Chronicle, the emerging folks like Allen and the Education News Network, which you'll hear about in a second, and what I think of as the NJOs, the journalism version of NGOs, the non-journalism organizations that are nonetheless putting content out there in the world, of which, honestly, the A-plus guys are, are a part. You have a lot more places to get your information these days. You have to understand what the perspective of those places is. You have to know that because that's got to be a filter for you. But there is more information out there in the world now than ever before. Through more means, more devices, more platforms, if you care, you have no excuse for not being better educated. You've got to know what you're getting. But I think that's the role that the media can play, is in giving you the information you need to make the best decisions at a very crucial time in the future of Texas. So thank you very much.